Good morning. Let's hang out for a few minutes, Tay, and see if anybody else shows up, okay? Okay. Um, just a little change, it's a good change in our meetings. Um, we're not going to meet on Thursday. I'm gonna give you that time to finish up your chapter eight assignments, get working on the test. Um, so none of the due dates as, as I have them set now are changed. We're just not going to meet on Thursday that'll give you time to really make sure you understand everything with chapters um, seven and eight. So you're still going to be sure to have, so what's coming up? Um, you will have your graded problems and quiz for chapter eight complete by the 27th. Your test on chapters seven and eight complete by the 27th, which would be next Monday. And then your smart book will be due for, for chapter nine. I'm just going to put you on mute there, Orlando. Um, for chapter nine will be due next Tuesday morning. So uh, everything else is remaining the same. It's just I'm going to remove one lecture for chapter 10 because I got into chapter 10 and really I just need two classes to lecture that. So it'll give you a little break that you can make sure you're all caught up with chapter seven and eight. Um, so no class meeting this Thursday, and then we'll resume with chapter nine next Tuesday. Do you guys have any questions on that? Cool, cool. And I'll post that in uh, Blackboard to remind everybody. All right. So to, today we are going to continue and finish up chapter eight. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint. The calculation part of the chapter is actually done. Um, you know, calculating stock value is what we focused on last Thursday. Where we're going to pick up is talk about the types of stock, the rights attached to the different types of stock, the um, different stock markets, and the inner workings of the stock markets. Okay, so let's get started. Common stock. So common stock is usually the first type of stock that a company will actually offer and sell when they become incorporated. Now, some of the things we wanna talk about are the different types of rights that are associated with um, the different types of stock. So we're going to look at common stock and then preferred stock. So you've probably seen these already, but we're just going to dig down a little deeper about these different rights so you really understand what, um, what is involved. Let me just see something quick. Okay, so I'm going to probably head out to a Word document so here's the rights just um, presented in our PowerPoint. Voting rights, what we call proxy rights, 
we're going to look at classes of stock and other rights related to common stock. So I'm going to shut that down and go out to a Word document. We could take some notes here so that we get some very specific information. So let me stop sharing that and share this Word document. Okay, so you should see a blank Word document. Just let me know if you don't. So first of all, let's talk about the voting rights. Now, usually only common stock have voting rights. And the traditional vote is one share of stock of common stock receives one vote. Now, what are you usually voting for? Generally, it is the members of the board of directors. Now, we talked about the board of directors already of a corporation. Remember, they are the liaison. They're the individuals that the um, stockholders, the common stockholders vote to watch out for their rights to be sure the corporation is operating to increase their value. That brings us back to our first chapter in finance. That's what they're always supposed to be focused on, increasing shareholder value. Now, directors are usually voted on at an annual meeting. Okay, now the key here is, and they pointed out in your book, if you're a shareholder who owns 10 shares of stock, you get 10 votes. So it's not a shareholder vote, it's a share of stock vote. Further, it is the outstanding shares of stock that get the vote. Now this isn't in your uh, chapter, but it's important that you understand that all the shares of stock that the company can sell do not get a vote. It's only the shares of stock that have been sold and are not owned by the corporation itself. And if you think back to your accounting 112, remember a corporation, corporation A could sell its stock into the market. We call that issued and outstanding. But if the corporation A buys any of corporation A stock back, it's no longer outstanding. So any shares of stock the corporation owns of itself are not included in this pool of stock that can vote. So it must be sold and the corporation cannot own any of its own stock in order for it to have a vote. So we wanna make sure we, we understand that. Now, how is voting done? And that is where there's differences among corporations. So we just don't assume we all get together and we vote. There's different strategies or ways directors can be elected. And the first one they talk about is called cumulative voting. And what's really um, important about this type of voting is if a shareholder Um, owns more than 50% of the stock, they aren't guaranteed to select the board of directors. Normally, if a shareholder owns more than 50% of the stock, they're in control. They get to decide everything. But that's not so accumulative voting. So it allows those people that we call minority shareholders, those that don't control the corporation, 
to actually have a say in the voting. So I like the example they present, and let's take a look at it. It's actually on page 251 of your book. In this scenario, the number of shares, whoops, or the number of votes are determined by the number of shares that a stockholder has times the number of directors being voted on. So the more directors that are being voted on, the greater the number of shares a stockholder has to vote. So in our example, it talks about, um, actually it's up in the top, to illustrate, it's right near the middle of the page. Paragraph starts with, right above cumulative voting. To illustrate, imagine that a corporation has two shareholders. So we have two shareholders. We have Smith and I think it's probably Jones, right? And Jones. Smith owns 20 shares of the outstanding stock. Joan own, Jones owns 80 shares. So if we just did normal, what they call straight voting, Jones would be able to pick every member because Jones owns or holds 80% of the voting stock. But that's not what happens here with cumulative voting. Let's say both of them want to be director. Jones, who owns the majority of the shares, doesn't want Smith to be a director. This voting happens all at once. And it depends on how many directors are being voted. So in our example, they say, assume there's going to be four directors that are being voted on, four director positions. Now remember, Smith wants one of those positions. Without this type of voting, he has no chance. Jones could elect all of them because he has 80% of the shares. In this voting though, Smith now has 20 shares times four directors or 80 shares. Jones has 80 shares times four or 320 shares. Now remember, there's only four position, okay? So there's a total of 400 shares out there, but there's only four positions, or I should say 400 votes, four positions. How much votes, how many votes does Smith need to become director? Well, he only needs 80, okay? So he can actually elect himself to become one of the directors. He's in a position now that he could do that since there's only four directors being elected. He has enough votes to accomplish that. So in this type of voting, we can determine if a minority or less than 50% owner can elect or, or play a role in electing a director. And the formula we use is one divided by N, N being the number of directors plus one. So if you own at least that percentage of the stock, plus one vote, you can actually elect a director. And that's what they talk about at the bottom of the page. So if there are N directors, plus one share will guarantee you a seat. So the more seats that are up for election, the easier it is to win. So this type of voting, cumulative of voting, allows 
a less than 50% owner to have a say in the election. So just to finish off with this formula, in our example here, we have one divided by four plus one, whoops. Okay, so that would give us one over five or 20%. Take a look at the example at the top of page 252. Just so we're clear, one more example. Stock in RJR, I did that backwards, huh? JRJ sells for $20 a share and features cumulative voting, what we're just talking about. There are 10,000 shares outstanding. There's that 10,000. What does that mean again? Remember, it's the shares of stock that get the vote. If three directors are up for election, how much does it cost to ensure yourself a seat on the board? So the question here is, how many shares of stock will it take to get a seat? The answer is 2,501. Again, take one divided by the number of directors which they tell us there are three plus one. So that's one fourth. So 25% of the 10,000 votes you would need to have 25%, but then you need one more vote. So you would need 2,501 votes or shares of stock. Now, if you own none of the shares, you would have to buy them at $20 a share. Okay, so that's how you would use that formula. Are there any questions on that? Now they do refer to straight voting at the bottom of page 251. So straight voting is one director is elected at a time. Now in this case, Smith can only cast 20 votes at a time, Jones 80. So straight voting allows for the majority owner to select the board. So that's why cumulative voting is a better option for somebody who doesn't own that majority. Something else that occurs, staggered voting. This is talked about in the middle of page 252. So many companies will not elect all their directors at once, but actually stagger them. So maybe there's only two directors of the five on the board that are being voted on. So they're not replacing the whole board at once. They're gonna do two this year, two next year, et cetera. This is called staggering. So when there's staggered boards, we call them classified. Because directors are placed into different classes with terms that expire at different times. It doesn't mean it's top secret. It just means it's categorized or classified. So not all the board positions expire at once. They stagger. Some this year, some next year. And that's the thing, once you're voted in, you don't get to stay on the board forever, okay? You have to be reelected and you have term limits, just like any other elected type of position. Um, the boards have been under pressure, as they state in the book, to stop this practice and to declassify um, because it's more difficult for minority. If you're staggering voting, less directors are being voted on in an election. So what does that mean? The minority shareholder doesn't have much of a say. 
as we said with cumulative voting, the more directors, the more votes for that minority shareholder. So the less directors, the less votes, less of a say by that minority. Um, it also makes takeover attempts. So less minority say, that's what you want to say it, and harder for takeovers to occur. So it makes it more difficult to vote in a majority of new directors. So if you have directors that are kind of pulled together um, and the shareholders don't like what they're doing, it's harder to break up that alliance under staggered voting. Okay, now there are some good signs of it if you wanna look at it that way. And they, they mention one or two. Um, it's institutional memory. So you don't always have new people coming on the board. There is a history. So an advantage of it is a history of directors. So if you have great directors that are working in the, um, you know, the spirit of, the, of what it's originally set up to do, watch out for your, your uh, rights, then this could be a good thing. Okay, and there's a history there. You know how they're going to be. So that's good also with long range planning because they're the ones who put it in place. They're the ones who will see it through for fruition. New board members may not take on the plans of old board members. So there, it has its advantages and its disadvantages are the point, you know, it's the point here. Are there any questions on these different ways that the board members could be voted in. This would be defined on the stock certificate, by the way. Okay. The next term is proxy. And proxy voting is where a shareholder gives another entity the right to vote their share of stock at an annual meeting. So there could be millions of shareholders in a corporation and they're all um, alerted to when a annual meeting will occur for the corporation and they're invited to attend and vote their share of stock. How many actually go? No, it's not. Whoops. I see there's a chat. Whoops. Okay. All right. I just saw that. Sorry about that. I've got a whole bunch of stuff here you're not seeing. How's that? Did you see that now? I'll make sure you see these notes too. Yes, okay, great, you're welcome. Thanks for alerting me. Sorry, I just saw the chat. So all the stuff I was just talking about with cumulative voting is up above here, <laughs> but I saw you were probably following along in the book with what we were talking about, but I do have notes, I'll make them available. But then the proxy voting. So. People are shareholders, people who own the stock are alerted to these meetings. You're invited to attend. Everybody who owns the stock is not going to attend. So others can ask for your, your vote and meaning they will vote your share of stock. So a lot of times management will ask for these proxies. Okay. So, and it goes on to say if, the shareholders aren't happy with management, then they're going to find somebody else outside of the corporation to go and vote on their behalf. Okay, so sometimes this is used by to replace management of the corporation by replacing the directors and basically making the directors that you voted in shareholders 
um, replace the CEO, the CFO, the COO. Okay, so, and when they, uh, management and these outside groups start vying for these proxy votes, it's called a proxy fight. So if you ever hear that term, that's all that means. So I always get proxies, um, meaning I always get alerted about meetings that um, I own stock in, the corporations. I've never gone to a meeting, okay? And quite honestly, I don't give anybody my vote. <laughs> but you can if you want. You don't have to vote, but you can also give somebody else your vote if you want to. Any questions on that? Okay, let's keep rolling then. So let's talk about the classes of stock. You will see, and this is common stock. We're not saying, oh, there's a class common stock and a class preferred stock. No, we didn't even start talking about preferred stock yet. We're talking about different types of common stock. Classes of stock um, were created really for one, to have additional shares of stock to sell, but they're common stock. And some of these don't have voting rights, even though they're common stock. So we usually see these designated as like a letter, class A, class B, etc. And they, they um, uh, in the book, talk about different uh, companies that have these different classes. Now, for a long time, New York Stock Exchange, which we're going to be talking about, did not allow different classes of stock with unequal voting rights. So either they don't have the same voting rights, no voting right at all, or their vote is looked at a different um, percentage than normal common stock voting. Okay, so they talk a little bit about that. We just wanna make sure that you're aware of it. New York Stock Exchange isn't too hip on putting a company that doesn't offer these um, same voting rights to their different classes of common stock, but non-New York Stock Exchange companies, meaning they're traded on maybe NASDAQ, that's where you'll see it more prevalent with their different kind of um, classes of stock because the New York Stock Exchange doesn't, doesn't want that stock trading on the market. And if you think about it, you know, the big advantage of owning common stock is a vote on how the corporation is run by electing that board of directors. Other rights. This is a big one, preemptive. And this is really important for common stock. A preemptive right to a shareholder means when new shares of common stock are sold, the current owners of the common stock have the right to purchase the percentage they currently own. So they get to first purchase, they get first dibs in these new shares of stock at their current ownership rate. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you have stockholder A owns 40% whoops, of the outstanding stock. So they get 40% of the vote. And it's a um, 4,000 shares. So that means the total outstanding is 10,000 shares. Remember, that's the stocks that can vote. The corporation decides to sell an additional 1,000 shares 
of common stock. The preemptive right says that the corporation should go to stockholder A and offer them, so they have the preemptive right to purchase 40% of those new shares of stock. So 1,000 times 40%, 400 shares. They don't have to, but they should be given the offer before anybody else buys any of those shares to purchase 40% of them. Why? Well, let's see. Before this new sale, stockholder A owned 40% of the votes. If stockholder A purchases, so if stockholder A says, yeah, I'm going to purchase the additional 400 shares, here's what they will have after the purchase or after the new sale. They will have their original 1,000 shares, or 4,000 shares, I'm sorry, 4,000 shares, plus the 400 new shares. So they will own 4,400 shares of 10,000 before the sale plus 1,000 new shares, or 11,000. So if you take 4,400 divided by 11,000, 40%. So their ownership percentage after the new shares still equals 40%. So they have a right to maintain that ownership percentage. What if Shareholder A says, nah, I don't want them. What happens to their ownership percentage? So shareholder A doesn't purchase the new shares. Well, now they'll have 4,000 shares divided by the total of 11,000 shares. Or 36% of the shares. So their ownership percentage just dropped by 4%. So if they weren't offered those shares, this is a way that ownership percentages could be manipulated. So stockholders know, I have the right to maintain my ownership percentage if the corporation decides to sell more shares of stock. Preemptive right. Are there any questions on that? All right. Some other rights that we're probably aware of, but we want to make sure um, um, you're, you know, we remind you of them. One is you have a right to a dividend when paid, and it has to be done proportionally. Whoops. So, you know, the, uh, Board of Directors is the one who decides to pay a dividend and they can't say, oh, stockholder A is gonna receive a 50 cent per share dividend and stockholder B over there, no. It's proportionally um, and it's done according to the class of stock and type. Um, you have a right to receive assets left upon liquidation. So if the corporation decides to close, not go bankrupt, but close, they'll sell all the assets, pay off the liabilities, and whatever's left, you have a right to receive that money as an owner. And you also have a right normally to vote on major decisions of the corporation. And they give you an example, a merger with another company. 
is an example. So that's a huge decision within a company. So those are, are our different rights and uh, different ways we could vote as a common stockholder. Are there any questions? So before we talk about preferred dividends, let's see, sometimes they don't pop up, okay. Before we talk about preferred dividends or uh, preferred shareholders, let's talk about dividends. Make sure we understand what dividends are. Basically a dividend is the return of capital to a shareholder, okay? So when we say capital, we mean the money they put in and money that's accrued to them or has been added to their original investment. Generally, dividends are paid out of what we call retained earnings. Remember what retained earnings are. These are the earnings of the business that are left for dividends. So a stockholder buys stock, the corporation gets the money. That's that first sale that happens in the primary market. Corporation says, I want to sell stock. This person over here says, okay, we'll buy it. The corporation gets the money. That's the original investment from the shareholder. We keep track of that in our common stock area. But then the corporation takes that money and runs the business and makes a profit or earnings. Those earnings are really for the owner. It's their money that made the profit. Now, do owners require that money be paid to them all the time? No. They're going to say, you could pay me a little, but then leave some of the earnings there to run the business. I'm not going to take it all out. The business, all you're going to be left with is what I originally gave you. The business won't grow if that occurs. So we keep track of all the earnings that the owners basically said, leave in the business in retained earnings. And every once in a while, the owners, well, it's really the board of directors, will say, let's pay the owner some money. Give them some of their profit back that we made for them because they gave us that money. And those are dividends. Now, a dividend is not a liability. They do not need to be paid every year. It's really on the whim of the board of directors. Some corporations may take a couple of years off from paying a dividend. For the longest time, Starbucks didn't even pay a dividend. They just started a few years ago. And then there's other corporations that pay them every three months, like Harley Davidson. So it really depends on the corporate policy when a dividend is going to be declared. And that's important. So dividends must be declared by the board of directors. And there'll be today, there'll be corporation board of directors going, we declare a dividend. And that's all that's happening is we're saying, we're going to pay a dividend at some point in the future. But it's on that day when they say we're going to pay that they're really creating a liability. Now they're promising the corporation's going to pay money out. But it isn't a liability until that day because it isn't a promised amount. Now, you'll see in our financiary and stuff, something called the ex-dividend date, which is usually the next date. And that's always quoted in uh, your finance shows. That's the date stock ownership will not receive the dividend. So what does this mean? Let's say we declare a dividend today, April 21st. We're going to pay a dividend. Okay, the ex-dividend date is May 1st. So the dividend will only be paid to people who own that stock on April 30th. So if you own it on May 1st, you're not getting the dividend. 
then the payment date is obvious there, right? So this is the day the corporation will send the dividend payments out. Okay, so we just want to review those dates with you. Now, what's important about a dividend? Dividends are income to the shareholder, so they'll be taxed. Okay, so when um, I just did my tax return and I have some dividends that I had from 2019, I had to put them on my tax return. Now, dividends, so you know, at an individual level are usually taxed at lower tax rates than all of our other income. That's just where we're at right now in the United States. But I remember a time before the mid 1990s when dividends were just taxed like any other money you made. Okay, dividends are not a tax deductible expense to the corporation. And that's the other key thing you need to keep in mind. Just to give you some characteristics of them, how they affect the corporation. They're not an expense. They can't deduct them on their tax return and pay less taxes. They are a taxable item to the shareholder. They have to put them on their tax return as income, okay, and the dates. Any questions? Let's keep plowing. Let's talk about preferred stock. So there's common stock, and then there's another kind of type of stock called preferred stock. Now, classes of stock, like common stock, you could have class A, class B, class C, it's still common stock. This is preferred stock. And preferred stock gets its name because the shareholders who own preferred stock receive a preference with certain items. Now, what does that mean? Well, dividends are a big deal to preferred stockholders. Dividends, when the, remember the board of directors up there goes, we're gonna pay a dividend. Well, they're gonna come up with a big dollar amount. They're gonna say, we could pay 50,000 in dividends. Well, if you have preferred stockholders and common stockholders, who gets the $50,000? Well, preferred stockholders get their dividends first. And it's usually at a stated amount. So they have a fixed or stated amount. Just leave it there. Thank you. And, um, they already know it, it's on their stock certificate. It could be a dollar amount or it could be listed at, as a percentage. And that's usually a percentage of a par value. And uh, par value is just a stated amount on the stock certificate. So if your par value is $2 and it's a 10% dividend rate, each share of stock gets 20 cent dividend. Also, they could be what's called Cumulative. Cumulative is the more common um, type of dividend on preferred stock. Remember what I said about common stock. Dividends are not a guarantee. So the board of directors does not have to declare a dividend in a year. It's not required. Now, preferred shareholders know going in if I buy this share of stock, I'm only gonna get 20 cents a year in a dividend. What if the board of directors doesn't declare a dividend in a year? I lose my 20 cents, not if it's cumulative. So cumulative preferred dividends, let's do it this way. accumulate if a dividend is not declared in a year. Now, let's go through an example. And 
you might be going, I remember something about this in accounting 112. So let's say Corporation A has 10,000 shares of preferred stock outstanding. We're just gonna focus on preferred here. Um, the stock has a par value of $100 per share, sorry. And a 5% dividend rate. It's year one. No dividend is declared. But in year two, the board of directors, BOD, declares a $5,000 dividend. And that would be, that $5,000 needs to be separated between preferred stockholders and common stockholders. Let's make that seven. Ah, make a 12, sorry. Let's change that to a $12,000 dividend. What does corporation do? Well, they're gonna say, first of all, have the preferred shareholders received all of their dividends through the, through the dividend declaration date here, year two? And the answer is no. So they're going to say, well, how much haven't they received that they should have each year? Well, 10,000 shares times $100 par value times 5%. Wow, that's a lot of money. I did that really wrong. Let's say 100 times 0 0.05 times 10,000, $50,000. So we didn't even declare enough this year to pay last year's dividend. So here's what happens. All $12,000 is paid to the preferred shareholders. And really, watch what happens. Year one, they should have received 50,000. They just received 12,000 of it. So they're still owed $38,000 from the year one dividends they never received. Also, they're owed the $50,000 in dividends from year two that they didn't receive. We call these Dividends in arrears. They're just, they're not a liability to the corporation. They're just saying, when the dividends are declared, that much of the money first goes to the preferred shareholders. So watch what happens in year three. So now year three, let's make this a good one. The board of directors declares a $200,000 dividend. Well, the first 88,000, these dividends that are in arrears must be paid to those preferred shareholders. Plus the year three dividend of $50,000. So now 138,000 is how much those preferred shareholders will receive. All the dividends they never received from the last couple of years plus this year because there was enough declared and being paid out to cover all of them. The remaining 62,000 is how much of the dividend will go to common stockholders. And we didn't give you information about them but there are common stockholders. Companies just don't have preferred stock. They usually start with common, and if they want to then go to preferred, or they'll offer them both at the same time. But that's how being a preferred stockholder, there's benefits. So usually preferred stock is cumulative. The amount that is on the stock certificate is what you are promised annually, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't get it because the board of directors never declares a dividend, it accumulates over on the side until they can declare enough to pay off the amount owed. Are there 
Any questions on that? So that's a nice thing about preferred stock. Also, preferred stockholders usually get their money or a stated amount, I should say, usually get a stated amount of money per share in corporate liquidation. So this is separate from the dividends. So what does this mean? <clears throat> Remember, we were talking about common stockholders. They have a right to the assets in liquidation. If the corporation decides, well, I don't feel like being a corporation anymore. We're going to sell all the assets, convert them into cash, pay off the liabilities, whatever's left over are for the shareholders. Well, if there's preferred and common shareholders, preferred will get their money back first at a stated amount. And they already know it on a stock certificate. If there's any money left over after they get their money, it goes to the common stockholders. So that's what they're talking about there. Okay, so you get you have a, a lot of preferences as a preferred stockholder, but the one right you don't have, preferred stockholders, whoops, do not vote. They have no voting rights. And you'll see in the next section of your book, you're supposed to really get and that's been a question over time because really these people are giving money to a corporation like a bondholder who's giving money to the corporation. They're getting money or being promised money every year. Their bondholders must receive their money every year as interest. Stockholders don't. So we sometimes say it's a mixture of the two. Uh, shoot. Not working right. Can you hear me okay now? No, okay. Let me go to my mm -hmm. one second. Could you hear me now? Okay, cool, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on with it. Okay, I am going to go, where do I wanna go now? Do you have any questions on any of that stuff we just talked about with preferred stock? All right, I'm gonna, Go back to sharing our PowerPoint. We've covered all of that. Dividends, dividends. All right. So now we're gonna get into the stock markets. And recall we talked about this already. We have dealers and brokers when it comes to selling and purchasing securities. Dealers normally maintain an inventory of stock, like a car dealer. They purchase a car and then sell it. So they purchase it from a seller and then sell it to a buyer, but they maintain a pool of the item and they'll do the same thing with stock. Brokers, pretty much like a real estate agent, bring a buyer and seller together. They never physically own the asset they are selling. They just bring the two, mark, the market transaction together, the buyer and the seller together so um, to sell or to buy a uh, share of stock or a bond. We have a primary market where stocks are sold for the first time by the corporation. And then we have a secondary market, which is where the stock is then sold between the buyers and the sellers outside of the corporation. So the main, the largest stock market in the world, which is in New York City on Wall Street, is the New York Stock Exchange. It's also referred, referred to as the big board. So let's go take a look. I'm gonna stop sharing that and we'll go out to the internet. 
There it is. New York Stock Exchange website. And of course they have, as we all do, our COVID-19 um, stuff and everybody wearing a mask. Okay, but here's where you could learn everything there is to know about the New York Stock Exchange. So we just wanna show you that. We're gonna talk about some of it. We're going to um, show a video or two because you guys saw my links there, right? So I just want to show you the exchanges there. And if you notice, it's called the International Exchange. International Exchange. And then we have the New York Stock Exchange listed separate. So let's stop sharing that. Go back over to our PowerPoint and talk about this some more. So the New York Stock Exchange for many years was privately owned. There's 1,366 exchange members. They used to be the owners. And an ownership, one of these ownerships, at, before it went public in 2006, sold for like $4 billion, $4 million. It was some outrageous amounts. So it was very expensive to um, be a exchange member. But then it went public. So now anybody can own the New York Stock Exchange stock. And they converted these owner positions to what we call license holders. There's still 1,366, that hasn't changed. Since it became public, it's merged with various other stock exchanges. And in November of 2013, it was bought and it is now owned by the International Exchanger, ICE. So it's not a separate entity anymore in the sense that it's autonomous, it's owned by an even larger group. It's still an entity in and of itself, but it, 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 all of the voting stock, there it is, is owned by ICE. Now, the New York Stock Exchange is a hybrid of electronic transactions and face-to-face. So what happens is, and this is normal operations of the New York Stock Exchange, is there's constantly people wanting to buy stock that is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and sell stock. Electronically, it's very easy to compare and match these two entities, okay? And most of the trading does occur this way. But before we had this technology, it was all done on the floor of the stock exchange. So we're gonna talk about the major players here. I'm gonna show you a video. I think we'll have some time to watch one or two. Um, and uh, so you can get a feel for these different players. The different types of license holders are what we call designated market makers, floor brokers, and supplemental liquidity providers. So first, let's talk about them. Let's see if, okay. And make sure we understand what they are. Designated market makers, DMM. Sometimes they just call them market makers. These are dealers of a particular stock. So they're assigned a stock. And they're constantly posting on the computer screens, bidding and asking prices. And you'll see in our video, they're also there to manage market volatility by purchasing or selling stocks. Remember, purchasing that stock will cause the market to go up. Selling the stock will make the market price go down. Purchasing takes stock out of the market. This is economics, guys, right? Drives the price up. Selling or pushing the stock back into the market brings it down. That's the job of the DMM here. They're managing the stock price. The floor brokers, these are um, individuals who actually are working with customers who want to buy or sell their stock. So they are coming to the DMMs, 
to settle the transaction. These are usually employees of, of large brokerage firms like Merrill Lynch. Then we have the supplemental liquidity providers. They are not on the floor of the stock exchange. They are doing what we call one-sided market transactions. They either buy or they sell. That's their job in the stock market. These are usually investment firms who promise to actively participate in a particular stock assigned to them. So they're also helping to manage price of the stock by buying and selling. That is their job. Now, so it's mainly these DMMs and floor brokers that are on the stock exchange floor. The, D, the floor brokers are coming to the DMMs. Now, a lot of the DMMs jobs though now are done electronically, or I should say the floor brokers, they're being done electronically because the floor broker, they're not allowed to run. So they walk very fast over to the DMM. What does that mean? If a DMM is managing Walmart, the floor broker has an order from a customer to purchase or sell Walmart stock. They're coming over to the DMM and trying to find the other side of the transaction. So that's what the DMM is bringing those two groups together, the floor brokers that are buying and selling for customers. So a lot of this though can be done electronically. You don't need that face-to-face. -face. Before technology though, that's what you needed. So those floor brokers, they're becoming a dying breed now. It's really that designated market maker. So the operations, as, you, as we were talking about, it's to attract and process order flow. Customers' orders to buy and customers' orders to sell and bring those two groups together and complete the transaction. And billions of shares of stock are traded a day, in one day, guys. So it's constantly happening. Now they refloor to the activity, the um, main stock market as the big room. And then there's the garage, which was actually a garage. <laughs> there are eight different stations. And we're gonna pull up the picture of the stock market, um, the New York Stock Exchange, I should say. Um, and they're in a figure eight and they have counters on them. And it's the designated uh, market makers who operate here. So they're the ones around these posts and the counters, watching, manipulating if they have to, working with the floor brokers. And the floor brokers are the ones that are walking very fastly, quickly, I should say, around the market to the different designated market makers to make the transactions for the customers. So I'm going to flip over. I could talk about that all day, but you guys need to see this stuff in action. So let's take a few minutes here. Now I could go to my, show this. Um, let's take a look at a little video. I might have to sh stop sharing this. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let me get my YouTube video going. Stop sharing that and share my screen here. Okay. It's about four minutes long. Take a few minutes and listen to this. You guys hear it okay? See it? Where is it going?
There it is. I'll post the uh, video. I put myself on mute because my dog was going to start barking. So that could be why the uh, sound cut out on you. But I'll post the video so you can listen to it. Um, it's a great video showing the what a DMM's job is and how the market operates. Let me take a look, grab another one. I'll leave my um, mute off. And we're going to look at one more on how the market works. It's about two minutes long. Can you see my, let's do it this way. I'm still figuring out. you could hear it through my video. Let's 
So this is the <clears throat> New York Stock Exchange. Do you hear the sound? And the spread is between those two. Okay. All right, guys. Um, let me, you don't want to see that. Stop sharing. So those are two great videos that just show you the um, uh, the operations of the market. And, you know, I could sit here and tell you about it, but to see it um, really gives you much more information. The other market, and we'll just wrap up with this, 
is the NASDAQ, the other major market, I should say. Let me do my slideshow. The NASDAQ, although if you go to Times Square, you'll see the NASDAQ with its ticker going where, you know, the stock prices and the different um, stocks that they carry on their market. It's not a physical exchange. Oh, by the way, if you were interested in learning more about how you can become a stock on the New York Stock Exchange, there's a whole area on their website. You just go to the New York Stock Exchange's website. NASDAQ, though, is all computerized. It's not a physical exchange. There's no, no floor brokers. They have market makers, okay, but, and they have multiple market makers. Um, but it's, you can't walk into it and observe it because it's all done through what's called electronic communications networks. And in your book, they talk about them on page 260. They're basically websites that allow investors to trade directly with one another. So investors buy and sell orders placed on ECNs and are transmitted to the NASDAQ. Okay, and these are placed with a market maker bid and ask prices, and that's how stock is traded. So it's just traded differently because it's all electronic. So our stock exchange is getting there. Now there's different mar um, market makers in the new in the uh, Nasdaq. So I just want to point them out to you. They are on page two fifty nine before we wrap up today, and. Um, the NASDAQ, by the way, stands for National Association of Security Dealer Automated Quotation. So that's just an acronym for a very long name. It's the second largest market in the United States. The over, it's an over the counter. They don't like you calling it that, but it is. Okay, and the market makers Bottom of the page, there we go. Um, 259, three separate markets. The first is the NASDAQ Global Select Market. So that's one market maker area. People watch that stock. People, um, companies like Microsoft are on this exchange or this market. It lists about 1,600 different companies. That's as of 2017. Microsoft and Intel are companies traded in this market. Another market maker area is the um, just the NASDAQ global market. NASDAQ global, it has about 810 companies. And then the final one is the NASDAQ capital market, which has very small companies in it. The smallest companies that are listed are in this market about 820. So it's really defined by how large the company is, what particular market segment of the NASDAQ the um, company will be listed in. So we're just giving you some background there. Um, there's three levels of information that a person can get on uh, and about the NASDAQ. So you could get this on the internet, the first is just quotes, that, that's level one. Level two, you view quotes, brokers, and dealers. So in level one, you're just getting accurate price quotes. But in level two, you're seeing more information. You're seeing information from the market maker quotes, what we call inside quotes, the highest and lowest bids and offerings. So you're seeing more information, but a level three information on the what on the internet, you need to be a dealer. Okay. And in level three, this is where market makers um, are only really seeing this information and they have access to it to enter and change prices. Okay, so you could read through that. And you know, I'm running out of time. Yeah, I got one minute, right? Okay. And there's also a link within the, the PowerPoint presentation that's in Blackboard um, to see more information about the NASDAQ. Here is the quotes 
that would be made, and this is on page 260. So this is what you would see if you went to uh, like finance and for yahoo.com or Bloomberg, and it'll show you where the stock previously closed at. So this is Costco, Wholesale Corporation, where it's currently trading at, if it's up or down dollar-wise, and what percentage it's up or down from the previous day. Previous closing amount, opening, where did it open this, today's market at? What's the bid price? What's the ask? They talked about bid and ask. And then it gives you price change and range over the um, particular time periods. Take a look over here, because this is interesting. Remember we talked about the price earnings ratio last chapter, or in this chapter, I mean. How much the uh, market values a dollar of earnings per share. And then it gives you earnings per share, EPS. So you can see how much earnings the company made for one share of this stock. Okay, there's an ex-dividend date. If the company was in the process of declaring a paying a dividend, it would list a date there. If you own the stock on that day, you're not getting the dividend. Dividend yield is presented here. We talked about that, the percentage the company is, or the, the stockholder is receiving in dividends of their investment. So if you bought the stock today, based on the dividend that's being paid, that's the percentage of return you're actually receiving. And there's a lot of other information. This is just a summary. So I encourage you to go out and look at this because you should be looking at all of these factors when making a decision about stocks. Okay, I ran out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, guys, well, thanks for, for coming today. And um, remember, for those of you who came in late, um, we're not going to have class on Thursday. We're going to take that time for you to get your chapter seven and eight information together. Make sure you understand everything. Get your test completed by next Monday and all your graded assignments related to chapter eight, smart book. And then next Tuesday, we're going to start our lecture on chapter nine. So have your smart book ready for chapter nine next Tuesday. If you have any questions or, or anything before then, just email me. Okay, so thanks again and everyone have a great day.